Hello everyone. I recently did a sub-panel addition in my garage and I found it was beneficial to tap an existing electrical feeder to provide power to the loads I was installing. Namely, when I added the sub-panel, I grabbed power for it from a pre-existing 100 amp feeder that goes out to my pole barn sub-panel. Tapping a feeder can be useful in circumstances where all the important criteria are met. I thought using the NEC feeder tap rules could save some time and money, but it's another good point that it also got me around the problem of my full main panel with no more space to add another two pole circuit breaker. Let's say you want to tap a feeder to provide power to a new load when there's already a feeder in the area with enough capacity to carry the additional demand. Instead of running another feeder, you might be able to tap into a nearby existing feeder like I did. If you tap a feeder, overcurrent protection must be provided for each phase conductor at the point where they receive their supply, except as permitted by section 240.21a through h of the NEC. Conductors can be tapped without overcurrent protection at the tap, as specified in section 24021b1 through b5. 24021b2 covers taps not over 25 feet long. There are several tap rules you might find useful, but for this video, I'm interested in the 25 foot tap rule. I think it's more straightforward and useful for the average electrician. Let's take a look at my feeder tap scenario as an example. The existing main panel and barn sub panel are here. The existing barn feeder circuit breaker is here. And the existing feeder cable is here. There was no junction box. So I added this junction box and tapped into this 100 amp feeder cable with these 80 amp tap conductors. The tap connections are in the junction box here. I used Polaris style multi conductor cable connectors to make these taps. Let's look at 240.21b, feeder taps. First sentence. Conductors shall be permitted to be tapped without overcurrent protection at the tap to a feeder as specified in 240.21b1 through b5. So we can tap a feeder without overcurrent protection at the junction point as long as we comply with the five specifications. Second sentence, the tap shall be permitted at any point on the load side of the feeder overcurrent protective device. We can tap into the feeder anywhere along its length. Third sentence, section 240.4b shall not be permitted for tap conductors. Now referring to 240.4b, the next higher standard overcurrent device rating above the impacity of the conductors being protected shall be permitted to be used provided all of the following conditions are met. Well, there's no point in going any further with reading the conditions, since this provision is not permitted for tap conductors. We can't use the next higher standard rating circuit breaker on a tap conductor. Our circuit breaker will need to have the same or lower rating than our tap conductors. Another question might come up, can we tap a tap conductor? No. By reading 24021B1 through B5, we find no reference to tapping a tap, so it isn't permitted. We hopefully also recognize we can't tap a tap for the simple reason that the tap we would be tapping doesn't have its own circuit breaker, so it could easily be overloaded. Let's go through the provisions of 240.21b2, 1 through 3. This is the 25 foot tap rule, where the length of the tap conductors does not exceed 25 feet and the tap conductors comply with the following. 
so the length of the tap conductors must be 25 feet or less. 1. The ampacity of the tap conductors is not less than one third of the rating of the overcurrent device protecting the feeder conductors. The tap conductors in our example have an ampacity of 85 amps. 85 amps is not less than one third of the 100 amp rating of the feeder circuit breaker. So we're in compliance. If we look at this example more closely, we see that the feeder circuit breaker is oversized for the tap conductor. In other words, the ampacity of the feeder circuit breaker is greater than the ampacity of the tap conductor. Because it's sized for the feeder, we tapped. This is important to understand. Tap conductors are protected from a short circuit or ground fault by the circuit breaker of the feeder they're tapped into, the original feeder circuit breaker, and they're protected from an overload by the circuit breaker they feed into. So, two, the tap conductors terminate in a single circuit breaker or a single set of fuses that limit the load to the ampacity of the tap conductors. Like this, the circuit breaker at the end of the tap conductor opens for an overload condition. This device shall be permitted to supply any number of additional overcurrent devices on its load side. Like these. All of the branch circuit breakers in the subpanel get their supply from the single circuit breaker at the end of the tap. The tap conductors are protected from physical damage by being enclosed in an approved raceway or by other approved means. My conduit is an approved raceway, but what do they mean by other approved means? It means get an approval from your electrical inspector before using whatever else it is you think might be okay. Now, before we can even consider tapping a feeder, we need to know that we aren't overloading the original feeder. To answer that, we must determine how much demand it's currently serving, and how much demand we're adding to that with the new loads. In my case, it was a no-brainer. The pole barn is a storage building. There's not much going on in there. It has very light demand. Almost nothing on an average day, where 99.9% .9 of days are average. So 99% of the feeder capacity is available for the new subpanel 99.9% .9 of the time. But I did a simple load calculation to figure the worst case scenario. The barn is a 1,200 square foot building. For general lighting loads, which includes receptacles, multiply 1,200 times 3 VA, 3 volt amps. I took that at 100%. Take the 15 amp 240 volt air compressor times 125%. The total load without demand factors is 8,100 volt amps or 34 amps at most. And that's never going to happen, ever. That leaves 66 amps for the new subpanel. Except again, this is a one man operation, so 99.9% .9 of the time, 99% of the power is available for the new subpanel. This configuration is always going to function trouble free. That's all the lights on. I'm ignoring the door opener since it's a low current draw and very intermittent. But here's an actual current measurement with the lights and air compressor. 13 amps. Seventeen amps on that line with the lights and compressor running. .3 
4.6 amps with just lights on, 4.4 amps with just lights. The most this panel normally sees is 17 amps. Coincidentally, that's half of the 34 amps I calculated. As I knew, there's nothing to be concerned with here. Okay, here's the first pipe I installed, the first one I needed to bend. This has an inch and a half offset in it. Um, the hole on the bottom is an inch and a half farther in this way, farther in that way than the hole in the bottom of the box. So I had to offset it to the back an inch and a half. Directly below here, there's a 90 degree bend that goes straight that way. And there it is. The 90 degree bend ended in an LL body. From there, the run went a couple feet into a 90 degree sweep. Then straight to an LB. The LB was at a 45 degree angle, so the pipe exited and went into a 45 degree bend, where it terminated in a 10 by 10 junction box. Here's the 10 by 10 junction box. The conduit and both sides of the SCR feeder cable entered this box where they were joined by multi-conductor connectors. The green wire gives me... I used pre-cut 25 foot lengths of wire, so I have a good idea how long my tap conductors actually are. Six feet and 16 inches to spare from where it enters the box. So if I cut off 16 inches and leave it in the box, that leaves me 5 feet to spare. Since we're used to seeing a panel with the main breaker at the top, some of us find it a little strange to see the way I installed mine. Kind of looks upside down. But in reality, many panels are designed to be used either way. The Siemens panels I like to use are my first choice when I don't necessarily need a squared EQO panel, which I like a lot. I like these panels because they have copper bus bars, among other good features. I've seen aluminum bus bars eroded away by arcing between the bus and the main breaker to the point where half the circuits in the house go dead. That's pretty concerning in terms of fire safety. But the feature that started this rant is invertibility. These PN series main lug load centers are invertible. That means it's just as good to use them upside down as right side up, and that can be pretty convenient. They're also convertible to main breaker use, which is how I used it. They can be surface or flush mounted. They're very well laid out inside, with two ground bus bars already installed. And they're plug-on neutral ready, which saves wiring time and reduces wire clutter inside the box. But they also don't require using plug-on neutral circuit breakers. Hey, if you're still here, thank you. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Please take a moment to like and subscribe.